All right, we are live now. I see people are joining us quickly. Hello, everyone. We'll get started in just a couple minutes. Uh, go ahead and let us know in the chat where you're tuning in from. It's always kind of cool to see uh, where people are joining us from. Um, one of these days we should give like a giveaway for the person who's tuning in from the furthest away. <laughs> anyway, hi everyone, thank you. We will get started in just a minute. Go ahead and let us know where you're tuning in from in the comments. Thanks so much everyone for joining us today. Just gonna give it another minute for more people to funnel in. Thank you so much for joining us. So while everyone's funneling in, I'll, I'll go ahead. It looks like our num numbers have leveled out a little bit. I'll get us started. My name is Mercedes. I'm with Rocky Nook. Uh, we have published three of Harold's amazing books. Uh, today, we're here to talk about creative garden photography. And I just wanted to let you guys know a couple things before we get started. Uh, one is that in the email you received when you registered for this, there's a coupon code for creative garden photography uh, for 40% off. So feel free to use that if you haven't purchased the book already. Uh, you're welcome to take advantage of that deal. Also tomorrow, we will send you another email with a replay link for this webinar. So if you miss anything or if you have to leave early, uh, don't worry about it. Tomorrow you'll get an email with a link so you can watch this webinar again. And that email will also include the coupon code for you. Uh, go ahead and submit your questions at, throughout the webinar as you have them. We'll get to them at the end, but whenever you um, think of something you'd like to ask, just go ahead and submit it. I have a little bit of a preference for the Q&A box versus the chat. It's a little easier to keep an eye on, but just go ahead and submit your questions anywhere when you have them and we will find them and get to them. So that's really all I had to say. Um, here we are with Harold. Hi, Harold, good morning. Good morning, Mercedes. It's so nice to talk to you. Thanks for asking me here. Yeah, we're so glad to have you on Earth Day too, which is a perfect day to talk about photographing, you know, the garden and the beautiful flowers and everything, which your work is so great. So I, I'll let you take it over from here. Okay, sounds great. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to be here. And uh, thank you, Mercedes, for inviting me again when you said do this on Earth Day. I said, how can I not do it on Earth Day? It just seems like the totally right time for doing it. So without further ado, I am going to uh, share my screen and my presentation because that's what it's all about. Uh, and Can everyone see my uh, my screen and so on? It looks good, Mercedes. Tell me if I'm if I'm showing a blank screen or anything. No, so this it looks good. Thank you. This is photographing flowers for transparency, and I am Harold Davis. I'm an artist, photographer, writer, and educator. Possibly in that order. Possibly not in that order. And this is the cover of Creative Garden Photography. It's a wraparound book cover, which is done using a, a, a light pad, one of my uh, favorite favorite techniques for uh, photographing uh, flowers. Oops, excuse me just a sec here. I'm manipulating computer screens. You know how that is. I have to show the cover of my book. Here it is. Create a flower photography. The cover goes around to the back. Beautiful book, thanks to Rocky Nook for presenting and making such a beautiful thing with our collaboration. I like to read the full subtitle of the book in honor of Earth Day, making great photos of flowers, gardens, landscapes, and the beautiful world around us. So this is a book that is about gardens, but it's also about a certain kind of landscape. And if you look at the table of contents of the book, as you can see here, there really are several major parts Parts. The organization of the book is to start with the garden at large and then move into techniques for photographing the garden up close. One of those techniques is the one we're going to be focusing on today about um, 
photographing flowers on a light box for transparency. And in a minute, I'm gonna to start to talk a lot more about that. There's also in, in there, high key photography, low key photography, how to infer it and so on. So I, I cover a lot of technical ground about both landscape photography and close-up photography. And as you can see in this list of figures on the left here and locations of gardens photographed, um, there are many gardens around the world and hopefully as things go back to the new normal, we'll be able to get out to some of these wonderful gardens that are not close by. And there are also a fair amount of technical diagrams in the book showing things like uh, f-stops in proportion, hyperfocal distance, and the fundamental law of reflection and important things for photographers who are technically inclined to know. This is the cover of one of my other uh, Rocky Nook books that was produced and designed with a great deal of care. And at the end of the presentation, we'll have a discount code for you on this book too from the Rocky Nook site. And um, an, another book that Rocky Nook, alas, didn't publish on flowers that I've done and some of my other books Here's the table of contents of this presentation. And I should tell you that we have a, an extensive and exciting presentation today. The plan is to do it in three parts. So first is the slideshow. Second, get out your popcorn. We have a couple of movies to watch. And I'm gotta, I always have a, a technical issue over Zoom with this that I've got sound for the movies on and that everyone has their popcorn, but hopefully we'll get there. And then um, why, do, why do it? And the third part is I'm gonna work through an example. So why do it? What's the point of this technique of photographing flowers for transparency? The section, who is your mama? What I mean by that is that when you look at a pixel, the pixel doesn't know whether it came from Photoshop or whether it came from a camera. So you blend the two and you can get the best of all worlds. Life is an illusion. What, what this is about chiaroscuro, how you arrange your photographs to create depth when there is no depth. The most important part of this process is arrangement. So I'm going to talk somewhat about arrangement. I'm also gonna show you the gist of how I expose for photographing flowers for transparency and also the gist of how I process for it. So this is going to be an extensive presentation. Now, photographing flowers for transparency. Um, if something is 100%, 100% transparent, uh, can you see it? No. So actually, Actually, the right title for this technique would be photographing flowers for translucency. A degree of translucency, a degree of transparency is called translucency. If something is fully transparent, you can't see it. So the title of my technique is unfortunately an exaggeration or maybe even a lie. Uh, here's, a here's a nice frilly tulip with the gestural leaves a photographed on a light box. And the important part of this image is for me is the gesture of the leaves somewhat because that lets you anthropomorphize this tulip. And we're going one, two. Here are two daffodils. The important part of these da of the daffodils are the onion skin-like part below the flowers as much as the petals of the flowers. And here are three peonies. Note that the peony photo is done on a simulated background of a washi, Japanese washi, and it's got a hand applied. This is a photograph of a print. It has a hand applied ink and stamp in the lower right. That is my ink and stamp. And it says photographer as poet, roughly speaking. These are white irises, sometimes called around here two week irises because at this time of year, they, blo they bloom in two week cycles. And uh, some nice red tulips, five of them. 
and some nice red poppies. I show these uh, particular images as an introduction to this presentation for, and it's part of the why do it part in the outline for a particular reason, but I can't really share what that reason is with you right now. So that'll have to remain a mystery. So I, I like to suggest that photographing flowers for transparency on a light box is a useful set of techniques, not only because you can photograph flowers beautifully that way, but also because you can photograph uh, other things like these uh, snap peas and this shell. What happens, arguably, if you vote, if you put something in front of a, like a piece of white board, white cardboard, and photograph it at the settings that your camera recommends? Put your camera on a tripod, put the camera on an auto, and photograph it. What's, good, what's the background going to look like? Well, it's going to look gray. So how can you get around that? You can get around that by lighting the background and the foreground separately. That, that's the standard technique and it works pretty well. Or you can use the exposure and capture and production technique that I show you in this presentation on the light box for, back, for a backlit photo that creates a bright white background. If you master this technique, you will learn a great deal about exposure and and this, that will carry forward into all kinds of areas of photography, not just flower photography. For example, you could create a demi tasse like this sort of almost Dutch ink drawing of a little of a little picture. The picture is mounted on a mirror, and the mirror is positioned midway in front of a light box. And sometimes when I really get going, I turn on the music late at night and crank up something taken in a lot of individual pieces and put it together in Photoshop like these compositions. This started as a butterfly specimen photographed on a light box. The color is added using LAB color in Photoshop. And the same thing with this uh, uh, sitting dragonfly. And here's a butterfly taking off in flight, going upward, same butterfly, rotated three times, up it goes. And, you know, I always like to say, you don't need fancy cameras for this kind of work. Here's a iPhone take of flowers for transparency on a light box. And here's another one. So who is your mama? Where does the image come from? Here's a panoramic light box work. And in this case, what I've done is I've inverted the background using LAB L channel in, in Photoshop. This is a technique that's explained in creative garden photography. And here's a photograph of dahlias on a using a textured background photographed on white with a textured background. We'll get back to this image in a bit. Here it is on white. Life's an illusion. This, this um, Magnolia Stellata, star Magnolia was photographed up close with a light box background. If you look carefully at the areas where the petals go over the dark branches, I like to point out that this is really an implementation of the Renaissance painting technique of chiaroscuro. The, in other words, when you have a contrast between light and dark, what that creates is an optical illusion of depth. So the post-production technique here is to exaggerate the blacks and also the whites. So here's Walter Isaacson, um, the on Leonardo da Vinci. So he says that chiaroscuro is a modeling technique for achieving the illusion of three-dimensional volume you know, in a two-dimensional drawing or painting. Well, that's also true in a photograph. And that's what, if you look carefully at something like the stems in that image of, a, of the uh, stellata, you can see depth in it. So what one's doing is one's ascribing depth 
depth because of the contrast between blacks and whites. And pretty clearly, you can use software like Lightroom or Photoshop to selectively to make a selective adjustment to increase the darkness and lights in an area. With an image like this one, the illusion is one of motion because seed pods are coming out of the top of the um, of the seed pod and I sort of tossed them around the light box to make it look like it was standing up. Most important part of photographing flowers for transparency is arrangement. We correct handling of flowers refines the personality. Um, this is sort of a corollary. It's, it's a complex corollary of the idea that if you want to make more interesting photos, stand in front of more interesting things. Or as Ansel Adams put it, sometimes he got to a place just at the moment that uh, the divine, that God wanted him to press the shutter. It, it helps to arrange to be at the right place at the right time. And just as it helps to have beautiful flowers, but how you arrange them is what counts. And what turns out, when you're working in the confined environs of a light box is that there really only are a limited number of structures that work. For example, this image here of red poppies, red corn poppies and blue iris, the arranging principle is a sort of stalk of the iris and everything else is arranged around the iris. The another common organizing principle for light box images is the mandala or the spiral circle. As you can see in this uh, pandemic image here of dahlias with, uh, with, a, with uh, some, a few other kinds of flowers around them, but it's basically a, a circular spiral mandala or this more complex mandala on the light box with pebbles, in a spiral and uh, things like beets and kiwi fruit and uh, so on. Here's a photo showing the way the room that I'm in now, uh, which is very funny to see really, looked a few years back uh, when, and here is a, there's a light box composition and here's the composition from the light box. So, Light box photos don't need to involve really translucent flowers. Something as opaque as this huge thistle can work pretty well on a light box as you can see it here. And so, so I have this photo in the, my deck here for two propositions. The first proposition is that you don't need to be too translucent. The second proposition is that we always hurt the ones we love, no matter how thick the gardening gloves I wore to crop this from the median of a street nearby here, it still went through the gloves and bit me with its thorns. This was quite a, quite a nasty piece of work, even though it's beautiful. Here's another kind of formal arrangement that works well on a light box, which is basically the bouquet. So you could have a virtual bouquet and photograph it. And here's another kind of shape, which is the flowers in a virtual garden with a lot of stalks. And here they are, and they're almost like a hedge or something looking at one. And this is, um, these are hydrangea petals. That's what the blue white ones are with some other pink petals in an arrangement. So here's one of the other common light box patterns, which is just kind of an organization almost a pointless organization of pieces in rows and columns uh, arranged together. Here's a magnolia stellata that is a portion of one of the shrubs that I cropped from a neighboring uh, bush. And the question for you to think about here, I'll give you a second with a thought experiment here, is, uh, what is unnatural about this image? What here would not happen in nature this way? Okay, the clock's going, 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 and you can put an answer into the chat box if you want. So here's the answer. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm getting to it first, so you don't have to. And uh, 
Ronald, you're right. The flowers are facing front. In nature, you might have one of the flowers in a shrub like this face front, but not all of them. So the process here involves cutting up the magnolia shrub and rearranging it with the blossoms facing all in the same direction front. But that's, and that's not, that's not a natural way of doing things. This is a L-channel LAB inversion of these uh, nice translucent poppies. Here's the original photo on white. By the way, this a much published image uh, used as uh, book covers, among other things. So we are going to get to the technical side of exposing here. And Barbie, that sounds right, no overlap. Mercedes, before I go on to exposure, are there any uh, relevant questions so far or irrelevant questions or irreverent questions or anything? There are a couple questions that I think would be helpful to answer before we move on. Um, one question is, are all these photographs that you showed in the book? No. Uh, I, I, that's an interesting question, and thank you for asking. We might as well have something beautiful up while I answer these. Uh, I, I honestly don't remember the overlap. There's certainly a, a, a big overlap. Many of these are in the book, but some are certainly not. For Apart from anything else, there's a lot in the book that doesn't have to do with photographing flowers for transparency. When I, when I look at the book, you know, uh, the, the sections that deal with this subject matter are roughly speaking um, from pages here it says light box photography yeah starting starting on page um, oh gosh starting what kind of light box works best well starting on page um, 224 and going to about page 250 so maybe 25 pages are about this kind of photography. And so there are a lot of other techniques and explorations in the book, including photographing on black and um, photographing out in the garden, how, what light you look for in a garden. There are a number of checklists in the book that have nothing to do with this, but you know, there are certainly, and there probably are some photos of this sort in the book that aren't here, but thanks for the question. Yes, we're going to we're going to get up to the setup in a minute. I see that as a question. Yeah, people are just generally asking about light boxes. What do you recommend? Is there a brand? It sounds like you have covered that um, in the book, you know, what size light box. But there is one interesting question, which is um, how about using a lap, a tablet or a laptop screen with a white screen app as the background for a light box? OK, let me let me just let me just make a couple of general remarks here. Yes, there's a fair amount of material about this in the book, number one. Number two, you, uh, I, I don't know how politically incorrect I'm going to be, but you can't be too thin, too rich, or have too big a light box. A big light box is a good thing. Um, there, the, besides the book, on my website, there's an FAQ about this. The FAQ includes a link to a plan with a bill of materials for building your own light box. Uh, the materials cost a, about $100 for a string of LED lights and the lumber at uh, Lowy's or Home Depot or a place like that. The, there also are a number of commercial suppliers, although I've been hearing uh, reports these days that getting light boxes uh, from Amazon and so on is a little harder or slower than it used to be because they're made in China and there have been various supply chain issues around the world. You can improvise almost anything to work for this. I gave a workshop in macro uh, photography uh, and in the, during the workshop that one of the assignments was go out and do something creative. And some of the students used a pane of glass with white paper over it and a regular household light box, light bulb for, for this kind of work. And some of the work was beautiful. Yes, I've seen work on a iPad or some kind of uh, translucent, some kind of screen like that, but it isn't very big. So that will limit the kind of compositions you can do. For close in work, that should be fine. Um, many kinds of things are possible. The light source for this work is surprisingly less critical than people might think. Um, it, it, arrangement is what counts. So 
I, I, so there are a lot of answers to this question and we'll be talking about it some more because I'm about to get into the exposure process. But um, the key answer is yes, material about this is in my book and yes, my website, digitalfieldguide.com, particularly in the FAQs has tons of information about it. Um, and Mercedes, anything else or shall I move on here? I, I think this is a good uh, point to move on from. I just noticed a bunch of, of uh, Lightbox questions at once and I thought, you know what, let's just Perfect. Let's throw those in now. So yeah, go ahead and, and move on and I'll keep an eye on the questions. So here's the, uh, here's, here's the cheat sheet, the five cent version on exposing. The goal is to create a white background. This is gonna take seven to 10 exposures with the camera in alignment on a tripod. Um, you wanna start with completely overexposed. You wanna use manual exposure. You wanna bracket shutter speeds. You wanna go with one EV increments. You wanna stop when you get to the, about the center of the exposure range that your light meter says is right. And I'm going to look a little more in the next few slides as to what that means. And I also will um, look a little more what reserve and HDR blend means too when we, get, when we get to the example. So just to review, here's what an underexposure histogram is likely to look like. Here's what an overexposure histogram is likely to look like. A histogram is a bar graph of the exposure values that, that are in front of the camera. So people get the idea that the perfect uh, exposure histogram is something like a parabola centered in the middle, but that's really not right. It's gonna depend what you're gonna be photographing. A black subject, a low key black subject is gonna look much more like the underexposure histogram shown above and a high key uh, exposure like one on a light box is gonna look a lot more like the overexposure histogram shown below. So here's the thing. For light box work, one only cares about the stuff that's to the right of the midpoint, okay? You don't care about the black stuff. And now your camera doesn't know this, okay? This is one case where you are smarter than the computer in your camera. There are other cases also. In fact, I want to pump up everyone's ego. Let's all say it together. We are smarter than our cameras. Our cameras are but tools. So let's look at this uh, Dahlia again. Shown in um, Adobe Bridge, here are the raw files that that make up the, this exposure, starting with the one labeled 8179 here, which is four seconds. All these exposures are at F16 for whatever that, that's worth. Four seconds, two seconds, one second, half a second, a quarter of a second, an eighth of a second, a 15th of a second, and then down in the middle bottom, a 30th of a second. That's the darkest exposure and that's obviously too dark. You don't need anything beyond there. You don't even really need that one. Ironically, that's the one that your camera's light meter is going to tell you is the right exposure. And that's what you would get if you put your camera on automatic and took a picture of something on a light box. This should be a good lesson that automatic exposure does not work a great deal of the time. Okay, so here is the four second exposure. High key, overexposed, not a whole lot of detail. Here is the 1 30th of a second exposure. Dark, no detail visible in the front. So the stuff you want is basically in between those two. And I'm gonna just roll through a few examples of the consequences of this kind of exposure and, and before I move on to processing, I, I wanna ask you, Mercedes, do people have questions about exposure at this point? We may as well, uh, we, we may as well settle it if we can. I don't see any questions about exposure just yet. Oh, there is one, uh, which is, do you both stack for brightness and focus since it's a higher than uh, F11 
not as sharp? Well, there's. Uh, thank you for the question. Mostly things on a light box don't have a lot of depth. Therefore, you're not going to need to focus stack. Uh, you know, focus stack can come, there is a section in creative garden photography about how to focus stack. It's a question that I get a lot in workshops and presentations and so on. Generally for most images, unless there's a lot of depth, you, um, you don't need to focus stack. So no, I don't focus stack on a light box or very, 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 very rarely. Also a slight misunderstanding about the lack of loss of optical sharpness due to a uh, smaller aperture like F16 or F22 or F45 or F64 to make, to exaggerate on a lens. Um, yes, there is some loss of optical sharpness. Most lenses perform best at a mid-range aperture, f8 or f11, not wide open, not shut down. It's going to depend on the specifics of the lens. Some really good lenses, like my uh, like my Zeiss Otis, work excellently at f16 with no apparent loss of sharpness due to diffraction. In any case, photography is a craft of balance. Whatever you gain in one place, you always lose in another. There, there are really no exceptions to that. So you have to understand how to work the trade-offs. The loss of optical sharpness due to diffraction when you stop a lens down is much, much, much less important than issues of depth of field that you gain by stopping a lens down. So I would understand the optical characteristics of the lens you use and experiment with that. But I also wouldn't go overboard on saying I can't stop the lens down to f16. As uh, Brian Peterson likes to say, there's a reason you have an aperture of 1.4 and, and also f16 on a lens, and that's because they're meant to be used. Uh, again, the quality of the lens matters a lot here. Th thanks for the question. Here's the um, cheat sheet version of post-production. You start with the most overexposed. So that would be the four second one in the Dahlia example. You use the same Adobe Camera Raw settings on each. You add darker images with layering, layer masks, and the brush tool. And then you consider adding the reserved HDR blend at the top of the stack to add punch. So with the Dahlia, here's a, a screen grab of a layer stack showing the images with the four second image at the bottom of the stack, the HDR blend at the top of the stack, and successively darker versions as you go up the stack. And I like to think of a layer stack as like a wedding cake kind of. Well, first of all, these are food metaphors, but there you go. Um, when you look down on a layer stack from the top layer, from the way the finished image looks, if your top image is at 100% opacity in the normal blending mode, all you see is the top image. But if you, of course, if you reduce that opacity, you see through it. So part of the technique here is that as the layers get darker, there's less and less of the opacity of the particular layer added to it. Another way to think of this, and it's a good way, is that this technique with lightbox photography and adding the layers lets you add successive layers at whatever level of strength you want to. So the problem if you do an average exposure of a bunch of flowers is some flowers will be translucent and light coming through it, others will be opaque and not. But at but there's no one exposure that can get both those opportunities. So using layers and masking in this way and the different exposures is a way to pinpoint with pinpoint accuracy all the exposures that you want. And here are some examples. This is the image that's on the, it appears in Creative Garden Photography as the cover. And uh, it somewhat got me to, um, it somewhat got me to expand on a uh, lightbox photography within the book because the 
wonderful people at Rocky Nook chose this as the cover from the images we submitted. And then they said, well, if you're going to run this as the cover, you have to tell people how to do it in the book. So it, it's an image with some history. I call this one into the vortex of the universe, and it represents another kind of composition with the cross hatches. And this is a a pandemic a pandemic poppy garden last year as we were just getting used to the idea that hey we're sheltering in place and I said well I'm going to make the best of it. This is our uh, printer so printing for me is a really important part of this work because I don't really see an image until I've printed it and uh, this used to be our dining room the kids say now it's our printing room. Part of what you can do once you have an image on white is you can put it on a variety of kinds of backgrounds in Photoshop to make interesting new compositions. So here's a background that I created by scanning a piece of papyrus and a piece of washi and combining the two. And then once you do that, it's very easy. There's a formula which is in, in the book for adding a image in front of a background like that. And you can create a unified set of images by care, by continuing. Here's another background. This is a scanned piece of paper. And here's some Easter lilies and dahlias placed on the uh, piece of paper. And a peonies panorama done the same way. Without um, exposure blending, this spiral of pebbles and uh, hydrangea petals would be out of the question because the exposure values are so very different. The pebbles obviously let no light through, whereas the petals are highly translucent. And here's another mandala shape, which is, um, I call this composition Paul Clay Wabi Sabi in Paul Clay and Wabi Sabi's garden. There, I've got it right now. So I put the butterfly in on the top. And part of the idea here is that flowers are beautiful even when they're not in their prime. So a fair number of compositions of mine are based on that idea. And you can put a single flower and like this on a light box, or you can group them. <laughs> The the thing about these uh, poppies as they're speaking to each other, very definitely having a conversation. And the clematis is just coming into bloom or beginning to show some blooms over our garden gate this year. But here's this wonderful clematis. So a lot of my subject matter, one of the questions I do get is where do you get your flowers? And to a great extent, I grow them. That's that's something like these poppies and the mallows, you really are not gonna get out of florist, particularly with the more exotic poppies. But sometimes I also photograph flowers that have come from a supermarket or Trader Joe's or sometimes from a neighbor's gardens. Here's a mandala. And here is the L channel inversion of same. Here's another pair like that. A uh, nice proteus flower, a clematis. This is a interesting technique with the uh, roses and the ranunculi here because it's partially a x-ray, a literal x-ray, uh, and it's partially a light box photo and the two are blended together. They're, they, they're in alignment. So you are seeing both the inside of the flowers and the outside of the flowers at the same time. And the same thing with this sunflower, another mandala here and some more. Ah, this, this, is, this is work that I've done in the last uh, week or two. So I keep at it with my light box. We're, we're in the middle of the uh, blooming season right now. A heart for uh, Phyllis, for my wife. And yes, I just did this. Uh, I just did this this week. Here's a, here's a frame. So that's an interesting idea. I'm working on a book on composition and photography. So I'm thinking a lot about the shapes that are involved in my uh, compositions. And I'm going to 
conclude this part of the presentation in a minute, but I want to leave you with this good luck dragon for Earth Day made of flower petals. Mercedes can elaborate on this if she will, wants will, but the discount code for Creative Garden Photography is Garden40. You can see it down there. This is um, this is at the Rocky Nook site. It is not through Amazon, and I recommend the print and ebook bundle because it's really only a very little bit more money to get both together. Uh, I think with the discount, six dollars more, and you can get both, which is just a stunning, stunningly good deal because you can have one on your device with the tables and diagrams and what you need to know on it. And then you can also have the book book and the book book is really what I care about most, but it's great to be able to have both. And the discount code on the black and white book is H Davis 40. Here's how to find me. And I do like to answer emails. Um, and this is a webinar I, that I have coming up in middle of the May of May, which and it's about tracking one composition from beginning to end with a garden tour if we can pull that one off, but we're going to try. And th this is a small group that I have organized in July for Iceland where they uh, where they're allowing people with proof of vaccination in as of a week or two ago. So if you're interested in that, there's a there's the link at the bottom of the uh, of the uh, slide. One of the parts that is exciting to me about this, it's an optional part of the trip, is that of course there's an active volcano right now and we're going to have some aerial photography of the volcano. And while while I answer any questions that have come up, I, I'm going to switch my screen so that I can start the movie. That's going to take a little bit of a while, Mercedes, because I have to stop sharing my screen. I have to open up the video app and I have to reshare. So why don't I go ahead and do that and I'll answer any questions in the meantime. Hi, Harold. We do have quite a few questions coming in. Um, of course, a lot are specifically about, you know, the light box. People are really fascinated by that. And I, and you did mention that you cover that more extensively in the book. So if anyone has a lot of questions about the light box, go ahead and check out the book for that. Let's see what I have here. At what point in your process do you work on color, hue, saturation, et cetera, type adjustments? <laughs> well, that's a great question. Uh, that's a great question, which there's no simple answer to. <clears throat> um, I, I, I take it that's a post-production question, not a photography question. I mean, of course, you work on color by understanding the color in your compositions. One of the things that I have prominently in my studio is a color wheel. And I like to I like to use color theory when I arrange the flowers. So you could say you start right at the beginning on color. Um, with this with this process, I don't do a great deal of color adjustment in the raw conversion of my files. Um, so so that so so that's interesting. Um, but I do it as I move along both <clears throat> both after I've after I've done the combination of exposures, then I then I do work on adjusting the color using Photoshop's tools, also the tools from Nick, the the uh, third party plugin, Nick Color FX, and also um, Topaz, Topaz Adjust. Topaz, Simplified Topaz Studio. Um, Mercedes, is there anything urgent there or should I, um, or should I go ahead and share the first movie? Uh, nothing is urgent. Let's go ahead and get to the movie and we can come back to these questions a little bit later. Sounds perfect. Let me just make, let's see if we can do this. Share screen and I have to make sure to click share sound and optimize for video clip. Here we go.
So Zoom sometimes, who knows? Okay, let me go on to the next one. <laughs> Let's see first. Okay, one more, get out the popcorn.
Okay, everyone. I hope you enjoyed our movies. I hope you had your popcorn there. Um, I'm going to move on and share and share processing of an actual an actual example. And uh, why did I get started with that? So let's see. First of all, I need to shut down the movie. Um, <laughs> now I need to share my screen. And let's do this one. You know, there's always a question of which screen. Now, okay, I'm gonna do that. Now, we are looking at Adobe Bridge. Okay, so here's a composition at a 15th of, this is the raw file shown uh, shown in simulation in Adobe Bridge. And yes, Phyllis uh, did the movies, definitely stop motion, uh, by the way. I could, there's so much I could not do without Phyllis. We could, we come as a pair. So a 15th of a second, let's see, F16, uh, ISO 64, my 55 millimeters ISO is great, beautiful lens. So a lens is a photographer's paintbrush and um, how it translates light through the unique crystals in it are part of what we have at our beck and call. I want to point out right up front that I could not possibly um, process the full size files in real time over Zoom via Photoshop. So after I roll through the raw files here and what they look like, I will show you the low resolution versions of these files that I've already prepared. So this is an eighth of a second. Here's a quarter of a second. Here's a half a second. Here's a ten, one second. Here's two seconds. And here's four seconds. And here's eight seconds. And that's the whole enchilada. So here are the low resolution versions. These have already been. Um, these have already been uh, processed through ACR. I want to say that I want to say because I saw a question about this, and it's important that I did not. Uh, I don't typically change the ACR settings at all. I just take the default. So, look. So, so to show you what that would look like here in the high version, I'm opening up ACR. I just I just hold down the Alt key. So I open a copy, I click it, and I don't worry about the settings when I make when I do this. So, so going back to the low resolution version, the first thing I'm going to do is open the uh, eight second version in Photoshop and that is going to appear mostly mostly white. Okay, one thing that needs to be pointed out here is that as long as your composition isn't blocked, it really, um, doesn't matter whether, it doesn't matter whether there's a tripod leg over part of the composition as there is down at the bottom right here because it's easy to paint it out. To paint it out, what I do is I take the sampler, color sampler tool, I sample my white background like this. I, so that becomes the foreground color I take a paintbrush, I put it at 100% opacity and 100% flow, and I right size it and I paint out everything that I don't want so that it's white. Of course, you know, over here, ultimately one would crop it, but you can also, but suppose it's, there you go. So it's something like, um, um, there's a chat box, covering things on the right side of the screen. Ah, 
How's that? So what I next do is I go to the four second exposure, opening up the four second exposure in Photoshop. I put it on top of the, in perfect alignment, on top of the eight second exposure like that. So let's label these. I haven't done that so far. Eight seconds. Four seconds. And I'm going to shut this one down. So I put a hide all layer mask, layer mask, hide all. And what you do now is you take the brush tool. And since we're toward the bottom of our wedding cake stack, we can put it at a lot of opacity. And as if by magic, paint in, oops, that was an overdone. So I can go back and paint in what we want like this. You can see more details of the flowers. So what I am doing now is I'm painting on the layer mask. Here's what this layer mask looks like. And it's painting in what we want. So now I'm going to go back and grab the two second exposure like this. Let me spend a little more time on, on how I copy it over with alignment. There really are two ways to do it. So this time, let me do it with the using the menuing controls. So what you, oops, I don't want it on a tab. Thank you. So what you do is you go, you go select all, you go edit, copy, and to where you want to place it, you go edit, paste. Note that there are keyboard shortcuts for all this stuff. I don't tend to do that in the webinar or classroom context because I want people to be able to see what I'm doing. So that's our two second exposure. And I'm going to shut down the file that was copied over it. I'm going to go layer, layer mask, hide all. And as I do, you can see the fact that there was the tripod leg over part of the composition matters not in the slightest at this point. So I go layer mask, hide all. And once again, I'm going to paint in, I'm going to take my opacity and flow down a bit. I'm going to put my flow down to 50%, which is where I often like it. And I'm going to put my opacity down to about 80%. That's a good place for it. And I'm going to start painting in the parts of this composition that haven't yet been revealed. I like this process very much because it's kind of photographic magic. The way it used to be for me in the wet film darkroom, where in the tank, a print would start to come out and I would start to see it. Um, So it's kind of like magic like that, as you can see the composition beginning to come out. What I do see over here at the bottom is some of the boundaries of the light box are also shown in here. So actually I can see what layer that's on. It's on this layer and I can go in with a black brush and I can paint that out since I don't really want it there. I can, I can use the um, keyboard tools to make my brush the right size. It's a little hard for me to get to in Zoom, but there I've painted it out. Now let me go and grab the next layer. So this is there's a repetitive element to this process where you're painting in each layer. This is the one second version. And this time to copy it over, I'm going to use the alternative technique. I take the move key, I hold down the shift key, I click somewhere in the source, I pull it over the target, I let go of the mouse, and I let go of the shift key. Has to be done in that order. It's faster than using the keyboard, but more prone to error. Again, I'm, 
I'm shutting the uh, I'm shutting down the other files. This is a one second layer, layer mask, hide all. And with a white brush at about 50% opacity, I'm not gonna get any 50% flow. I'm not gonna get any less than that on flow and maybe 75% uh, opacity. And let's paint in, let's paint in some more stuff. And I think we'll do one more layer after this, and then I'll show you something else. And um, the uh, so we're getting there with this image. It's beginning to be the way one would like it. Oops, that was too dark. I'm going to undo that. In fact, yeah, this looks pretty good looking. It's beginning to be the way it is. All right, let me go and grab a next one. And again, I'm going to pull it over in alignment. This is half a second, 0 0.5 second. As my pedantic high school math teacher reminded me, always put the zero before the point so people know what you're talking about. Layer, a layer mask, hide all. And here you want to be careful to just paint in the things that still need painting in, but not the things that are at the opacity you want them to be. So things become a little more delicate. Perhaps your brush becomes even a little smaller. Think about that. And, but this is beginning to look pretty good. Sort of like magic, isn't it folks? We love our magic. And the magic loves us. On Earth Day, Flowers are really happy when we can render that which is so beautiful in this world, in this wonderful world of ours, whatever its problems, it is a wonderful, beautiful world. And it's always wise to remember that. Before I leave this example, I wanna show, well, first of all, I've got some more uh, stuff down there that needs to go. What layer is that on? It's on this layer. So we can, we can do that pretty easily. Go like that. We have to make sure that we're actually painting on the thumbnail of the mask, not on the layer itself. There are a number of ways this whole kind of thing can go wrong. Let me go back to my uh, reduced files here. And I'm going to select them all. That's one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm not gonna select anything darker than the half a second. And I am gonna run them through Nix HDR FX Pro. Remember I said reserve a um, reserve a high key uh, blend. For some reason this isn't doing anything, which is annoying. There we go. Generally, generally you don't want to have the alignment or ghost and ghost reduction boxes checked in this thing. Um, and that, that there are comparable boxes in any HDR program, whether it's Lightroom, Photoshop, Aurora, or uh, whatever it is. But again, uh, as an example that we are smarter than the computers that we control here. Consider how dark this image is. And that's really not what you want. So what you're gonna have to do is to, uh, you're gonna have to take the, you're gonna have to take the um, whites up, the shadows down, highlights up, and exposure about 100%. 
and let's put the temperature of this thing up too. Still not terribly attractive looking here, but it is perhaps what it is. So this is what an automated HDR blend of this image might look like, although I have seen better renditions of things. And then I can put it over the top of my image. Let's make sure, no, we're not quite at the top layer here. Um, for some reason, my uh, well, it's because I reduced the depth of the other image mode eight. So running into well let's see gonna have to stop sharing for one sec and see if I can get this software to behave give me a second here Nope, Photoshop stopped responding. So I think we're gonna probably have to, unless, let's see, unless I can. Uh, think we are gonna have to leave it here, folks, in terms of this demo, because my computer has stopped responding to my commands. But I think that, uh, Um, I'm ready to answer questions of which I'm sure there are many. Is that right, Mercedes? There are quite a few questions. Unfortunately, I don't know that we will get to answer all of them. Um, some people are asking very specific questions about their specific gear and how to apply it. And I don't know that we want to go into those as they'll really only apply to those specific people and not to everyone in general. Um, but could generally I think what would help is if you could talk about you know remind everyone where they can find information on how to purchase or make their own light box and then I'm seeing questions about how you handle uh, lighting when you're doing the light box do you have a top light as well just people are kind of curious about that process do you have a tripod that faces down um, and you know if you talk okay. about these uh, depth in the book you feel free to let us know that as well yeah, give me give me a second here because my memory banks can take about that many questions. But, but so, <laughs> first of all, there's a lot of sections on tripods in the book. Um, so, anatomy of a tripod, tripod, how you get it to face down, page ninety six to one thirteen. It's all about tripods, how you should spec a tripod, what you should look for, how you use it. So, I'm going to refer tripod questions to page 96 to page and to page 112 in uh, creative garden photography. Also a lot of information on light box work. That's pages 224 through 271. So that's a great deal of material on this. Also on my website, there's FAQs. Also, I have written a ton of blog stories on this. There, there are thousands of blog stories on my on my blog. Um, the oh, hold on one sec. I think I see the problem here. Ah, uh, yes, I do. It's a. Let me see. I'm going to I'm going to reshare my screen for a second before, because I think I can um, if I can see where and how to reshare my screen. Because, 
Okay, here we are. Um, okay, give, so here, so So I, I so I had this HDR blend which wasn't very good, and I'm now copying it over my um, other image, we, like that. Now we don't have a screen here, so so. Okay. You have lost screen graphics and I'm gonna get them back. I think I know how to get them back. Um, so give me one sec here. We better save this. Save it. And I'm gonna quit Photoshop. And Reopen Photoshop. And so, so now, now we're sort of back to where we ought to be here. I'm going to put a layer mask on this layer layer mask hide all and what I could do if I want to get a little more resolution in the center of flowers is carefully without too much opacity paint them into the center a bit like that. See so what the HDR blend does is it adds a bit more depth to the center of the flowers and places where I would like to see a little more. Well, that's way too much there but you get the idea a little a little more uh, sort of depth and structure. What I can do now is I could flatten the image and I could crop out the parts of it I don't want. So so that so that would be how I'd tend towards finishing the image to get something that one might want to see out of it. So, So here you go, that's, that's something like the finished image there. And then you could save it off um, with, a, with a different name, like save as a sample image. Like that, and you have yourself an image. So there you go. And, you know, I think, um, okay, so tripod we've kind of handled. Um, why do I do it this way as opposed to importing everything from, say, Lightroom as a layer stack into Photoshop? As an alternative workflow, you perfectly well could do that, although that wouldn't work so well with the HDR part. But I prefer to do it this way because you know it's in the right order and you can see what you're doing. You can see what each part of the wedding stack does to what's below it incrementally as you add on. There's a tendency if you imported the whole thing as a stack to go too far too fast too soon, which is of course always always a problem in life too. Um, there's, I, I see a bunch of questions about what, are, what, about what uh, alternative lighting that I like to use. Um, um, in the room besides the light box. Keep in mind that a light box is a backlighting mechanism, okay? So you're backlighting these flowers. That leads to some interesting points. Point, point one is that 
to the extent that you use light in the front, you're going against the purpose of the backlight. You now, sometimes some areas of flowers or other subjects need light in the front. I, I like to use day, controlled daylight where possible. Sometimes I also use a, uh, a, a photo light of some kind. I control it or maybe even a little flashlight in motion on the center of a flower. But mostly I just use the ambient light in the room and I need a darkened room. You can't do this if there is too much sunlight in the room. So the real answer is that some of the images I've shown you were entirely done with a light box and no ambient light, and others have a bit of controlled ambient light on the front. Um, all right. So Mercedes, do you have a sense of what other question I should answer? Let's Where? see here, uh, real quick, because I see this coming up. Yes, this presentation is recorded. Everyone will be sent a replay link tomorrow. So if you missed anything or if you came late or if you want to revisit, you'll be able to do that tomorrow. And, and I, sh I should also mention, um, along, along with the wonderful job here that Mercedes is doing, we, we've got quite a few webinar recordings that are linked on our site that you can watch about some of this material. Um, so that, that's something to think about too. Here's a good question. How do you arrange the flowers so they all face the way you want? Do you use anything like putty or clear silicone to prop or hold them down? Uh, yes. So I use a couple of different glues. This is clear gel tacky glue, Eileen's original. Um, clear gel tacky, it's tacky. And there's also a product called Museum Gel, which is great because it's totally uh, removable. I also sometimes use a paper clip. Remember that in post-production you can if accidentally you see something like a bit of a paper clip, it's easy enough to remove it. So, so yes, I use lots of things like that to position flowers, hold them down, as in fact do the great uh, Ikebana Japanese flower arrangers. They also use holders of various kinds as well. So there's nothing really unfair about that. Um, I see what book describes your LAB techniques. Well, you know, the best one is creative garden photography. It's got it all. Also one of our Photoshop darkroom book has LAB material in it. And yes, poppies are a very emotionally significant, particularly corn poppies. They're, they're, they are the remembrance from World War I, that is right. And thank you very much for everyone who said nice things about our book. This is one from Diana who says, this is the book I've always wanted, needed, and never knew it existed. Many thanks. So thank you. I mean, I, this book is probably my favorite book that we've ever done. So I care about it a lot. I do use the Lens Baby lenses. Uh, I've, I have for a long time. My favorites are the velvets, which are most like real lenses. Um, any any more questions I should prioritize, Mercedes, you think? Scroll to the bottom here. Do you always put the HDR image on top and which image do you create the HDR from? Well, the HDR comes from the combination of images. And yes, I always put it on top. I don't always use it. Um, people are asking about you know, how many, I, I think you touched on this, how many light sources you use when you're using the light box? Do you have natural light in the room? Do you have a light on top of it as well? Yes, mostly it's the backlit from the, from the light box and the light in the room, but sometimes I also put other lights involved. And then people are curious of like how much time you have between picking the flowers and photographing them so that they still look fresh. Yeah, you know, that's a great, a great question. Uh, it depends on the flower. Some last longer than others, as florists know well. It also depends on the temperatures where you are. And so there are a lot of variables there, but not very long. Uh, with the poppies, probably less than an hour. What I tend to do with, with uh, poppies from our own garden or other flowers from our garden is I cut them and handle them the way I would a cut flower arrangement. So I put them in some lukewarm water with plant food 
with flour, cut flour plant food in the water and let them sit there for a little before I actually put them on the light box. You also can uh, make flowers last a little longer and be a little more flexible if you use a little bit of warm water on the petals. That's a great tip. That's a great question, by the way. And I should note, you know, I'm. Uh, you can email me. My uh, email address was in one of the slides here, and it's also on my website. And I, I would try to answer questions. There are, I mean, I think I touched on this earlier. There are a lot of questions about the light box, the X-ray, the lenses you use, the lighting. <laughs> um, stop! 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 That's, that's a lot of topics. <laughs> uh, lens I first of all people often say think they need a macro lens for this kind of work and you and and you don't this is primarily this is an issue of geometry and most of the images I showed you are not close-up or macro images they're basically something like portrait distance I use a normal prime lens 55 millimeter on a full frame camera okay what what else the x-rays are real x-rays a lot of them were done I, if you go to my website you'll find an faq on my x-rays as well as a couple of pages on x-ray uh, photography and a, a portfolio of images and so on they they were done the x-ray portion of those images are done using a real um using a real x-ray machine, largely a mammography machine in collaboration with a radiologist, my radiologist and friend, Dr. Julian Kupfka. Great, I had one more I wanted to ask you and then we're, we're approaching the hour and a half mark, which I think means Zoom will, will end up cutting us off. Um, here it was. If you're using glue to position the flowers, what is between them in the light box? Sometimes nothing. <laughs> you know, you can clean a light box typically with uh, rubbing alcohol or, or soap water and paper towel or cloth. Uh, cloth might be better. Um, so sometimes uh, nothing. Sometimes, as I said, I you will use a paper clip. I even will tape. Uh, paper clip to the light box and then a flower. But then suppose you want another flower connected to the first one, you might use a drop of, uh, of the tacky stuff in there. If it's going to be the museum gel, that's pretty much generally straight on the light box because it comes off very easily. Great. And when you arrange your compositions, are you simply placing them on the light box or do you physically compress them or flatten them? I do not flatten them very much. Uh, 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 I, I used to flatten a little bit. And when I did that, I would use a piece of plate glass to so I could see what I was doing. But the problem is flowers that are flattened look broken. And I don't want my flowers to look broken. I'm, I feel heartbroken enough that I have to cut them to photograph them in this way. Uh, Great. I think I think we'll wrap it up there. There are quite a few questions still, but they all seem pretty specific. And I know we won't really, um, we wouldn't have the time to get to all of them anyway. But thank you so much, Harold, for, for joining us today. This was kind of the perfect way to celebrate Earth Day if you have to stay inside. <laughs> and I just want to remind everyone you will be sent a replay of this webinar tomorrow. Uh, so check your email for that. Again, there will also be a coupon code for the Creative Garden Photography book from the Rocky Nook website. I will just note that those coupon codes are only um, applicable on the Rocky Nook website. You can't use them on Amazon, for example. Uh, so thank you all so much for attending today. This, I hope this was helpful for you. It was really cool to get to see some of these photographs and learn about your process behind the images. And thank you so much, Harold. Oh, thank you, Mercedes. This was fun. And thank you for being such a great moderator. No problem. Have a great, uh, have a great day, everyone. Enjoy, enjoy the rest of your Earth Day. 
yes, have fun for Earth Day, photograph flowers, get out there if you can, go do things. I'm going to photograph flowers and maybe also do some work in our garden. It's a, it's a kind of blustery, surprisingly cool day here in Berkeley for Berkeley, and uh, I intend to enjoy it in good Earth Day form. So I hope you do too, and thank you for spending your time with me. Great. Bye. Bye.